Welcome to Media in the Mix, the only podcast produced and hosted by the School of Communication at American University. Join us as we create a safe space to explore topics and communication at the intersection of social justice, tech, innovation, and pop culture. Welcome back to Media in the Mix. I'm your host, Grace Ibrahim, and uh, today we have a very special guest, Trace Dominguez who graduated from American University in 2010 with his master's in public communication. Uh, We're gonna get into a little bit of your capstone project that you did there. Um, But Trace, is there anything else you wanted to add? Um, Gosh, I think if I hadn't gone to American, I wouldn't be where I am now. I mean, that's a little cliche, but or trite or whatever, but I literally got the internship at Discovery that kind of launched my career. Uh, because they did an info session on campus. So That's it was so cool. cool. I didn't know that. Okay, wow. So I'm learning a few new things. That's awesome. Um, so actually, I'm just going to dive right into your time at AUSOC. Uh, what actually first, what made you kind of want to go into the public comms sphere? So I graduated my undergrad with a degree in behavioral psychology. And I thought, okay, I, a lot of people who get that degree, they end up working with children with autism or doing some kind of organized behavioral therapy. And that wasn't for me, I had looked at it as an option, but it wasn't what I wanted to do. So I took a few years off between my undergrad and grad program. And when I went to look for grad programs, I was looking for something that was practical, something that wasn't like a two or three or you know so on year program so I could just get working. I wanted to like go and get a career in media in some capacity. Um, and so to do that, I looked around at different programs and I ended up applying to several. Um, And American, I really liked the program. I liked that it was a one-year program, that it was really intense, and I could just, like, devote my time to it uh, and ended up going and really, obviously, worked out for me. So I think it was was awesome. I do have a little follow-up question there. I know a lot of our students, a lot of them do take the two. Like, for example, I did the two-year master's program. I saw my you know, cohort and the people in my peers take the three year, the MFA. Um, so they had even that extra additional time. Is there anything yeah. that you can provide just for like what to expect if you do end up taking the one year program? Because I know a lot of people will say it's intense, but, you know, just yeah. elaborate on that a little. I mean, yeah, it, intense is the word for sure. And, and and it's not so much that it's difficult intense. It's just mm-hmm. you have to dedicate your time to it. You know, I was I, I found an apartment right near campus that I could walk to uh, the classes that I needed to take. And you were in classes all day and then doing, you know, either at the library or doing your work at night. And, you know, it, there wasn't as much time to just casually take a master's program. Not that any master's program is casual per se, but it's just it felt like, okay, I, I'm going to do this all day, every day. And I remember the day after graduation, I like popped up in bed and I was like, okay, well, what do I have to do today? Cause I had this like routine where I had this list of things that right. I constantly was getting done every single day. And I was like, oh, well, I graduated. So nothing right now. Like I, <laughs> I could just take some time. And I remember not knowing what this is silly but like not knowing what the popular music was not knowing what was like cool uh on youtube or whatever like i just didn't because i wasn't paying attention you know we had a tv i didn't use it i didn't have time i was doing something else and so it was just like i could have probably carved out time to do those things um but i filled my free time with social time usually with my other cohort which is cool That's it. That's very cool. Yeah, I feel like it, a one year really gives you time to bond, even though you may not think you do, because it's like yeah. so intense. You're always together, always doing things together. That's awesome. Do you remember any of the classes that really stood out to you, or like a professor that stood out to you? Favorite memory? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, the main, the first class that I took um, really stood out only because I got to meet with. Like with it was Rick Stack's class, and I I really just got to meet all of the students and like the other people and see where they were from. Mm-hmm. Um, I really liked Dottie Lynch's class about polling. I thought it was really interesting and learning about you know kind of the practical application of these things that we were learning. Um, Lauren Feldman's class was really interesting. I took uh, a class about international PR, which was cool. It wasn't quite what I thought it was going to be, but it was really interesting because we each got to pick a country and then learn about that country and how their PR might work, which I thought was very cool. And then we did like a presentation at the end. So it was, there were several classes that obviously stood out, but I think generally speaking, it was the thing that really stuck out 
to me, aside from, you know, the practical application of stuff, which was, which is my jam. That's what I really enjoy. Um, is just seeing how everybody approached it differently and where they all wanted to go. Uh, cause my goal was to get into a media sphere in some way. Um, and not everybody wanted to do that. A lot of people wanted to go into PR in a more traditional aspect. Some people didn't want to do PR at all. They were just learning to have that like thought process of kind of strategic communicating. Yeah. Um, so it, everybody sort of had a different goal. And that was, I think that was the thing that I liked even more than just any individual class. Did your expectation of your career, so I know you said you always knew you wanted to go into media, but did the expectation of your career change from the start of that program to the end? Was it what, you know, you, you kind of changed your mind a little bit there? Did you surprise hmm. yourself with anything? No, I think I just focused a little bit. I didn't really change my mind on where I wanted to go. I just focused on what I was interested in more. You know, seeing what other people wanted to do and where they wanted to go and how focused they were on it sort of helped me distill what it was that I was looking for. Um, and how I always think of it now, like looking back, I don't know almost how I felt at the time, you know, because uh, it was all in flux. But now when I look back, I think, I wanted to work in media and I didn't care how I was going to get there almost when I started. And by the end, I was like, oh, I want to work in these specific places in media, you know, something where I can feel good about what it is that we're making. That's great. I like that. And then how would you just uh, uh, overall, because I have like a million notes here of what you did, what you do now you know, <laughs> videos and the, the different areas you're in. Um but I have a sentence here, which I pulled from your bio. Basically, he primarily focuses on quantum mechanics, astronomy, psychology, engineering, and agriculture when it comes to your media work. Um, why? What kind of drew you to getting into that? And I know this is actually a nice segue from um, an episode that's going to be released a little bit before you. We talked to David Ruck, and he talks all about how he translates kind of the science in the field into video form. And so you guys mm -hmm. both kind of remind me of each other because that that is very interesting and that's not – a lot that we think about, you know, a lot of people consider kind of the field of like STEM to be numbers and analytics and this, but being yeah. able to kind of translate it, translate it into a visual form, um, basically what got you into that? And can you just elaborate on that anymore? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, so if you don't know what I do, I guess, aside from the bio that we're putting in the episode, <laughs> I'll, I, I basically, I make science videos is when I, you know, if you're in a lift and somebody's like, what do you do? I'm like, I make videos. And if they push, I'll say, I make science videos. Um, because people love either love learning about this or they are like completely turned off by the science part of it. Right. Um, and I don't say STEM too often only because then people are like, well, what's that? I don't even know what that is. Uh, so I, I basically, I'm a science communicator. I didn't know what that was when I started my career. Uh, I was told that that's what I was. And I said, oh, okay, sure. <laughs> um, but translating science and technology, engineering, math, you know, into visual uh, is, can be complicated. Uh, and it can, but it's also really fun. It's a puzzle uh, every time. So when I make videos, when I sat down to like, kind of start my career, I got an internship with the Discovery Communications Company in Silver Spring. Um, and I was the Discovery News intern. So it was my job to kind of do journalistic science coverage. And that's where I sort of cut my teeth and learned what it is that that even meant. And what it really means is not not just like, hey, there's a new paper out, let's read it. It's, it's more like what's happening in the world, just like any journalist. Mm -hmm. And what is it that we can look at it from a science lens? Oh, there are, you know, whales swimming into the Bay Area during the pandemic into the San Francisco Bay. What does that mean? And did they always come in there? And were they going there before? And why weren't they? Why were they? And it turns out, you know, boat engines, even though we don't hear them because they're vibrating the water, whales can hear them for hundreds of miles. And so they avoid them because they're quite loud. Uh -huh. If you think of it as sound as moving through the water as opposed right. to the air. And so like boat motors and boat channels, whales avoid them because they're, it'd be like going into a construction site for us. It's right. just very loud. And so even just, just how we describe what that means and how we're translating how whales are hearing things, you know, it's just taking a regular story 
and putting it through a lens of science. And so when I say things like quantum mechanics and psychology and engineering, you know, we're doing videos about airplanes, you know, we're doing videos about computers, we're doing videos about what things that people use on a day to day basis and trying to make it relevant. Um, and sometimes that involves getting into weird, esoteric science things. And so I'm a generalist, I'm not an expert in any specific science. Uh, so I'm always trying to learn something about all these different facets of it. That's very fascinating. I love that. I feel like I'm like your target audience for that stuff too. Because <laughs> when I hear, you know, quantum, like I'm like, I don't know anything about yeah. it. But yeah. I'm a very visual learner. So I could see how that's so beneficial to anyone, even in the science field, who is a visual learner. Like that really yeah. could help you more so than words on a page. So that's actually. Awesome. I I think that's a really good point because I think people think when they think of science communication, like, oh, it's science nerds that watch that. That's just for science nerds. Right. But science people don't all know the same thing. Just like, you yeah. know, you go to SOC, you don't necessarily know how uh, somebody in a crisis comm PR agency works versus an advertising branding agency. They don't know how each other work. Right. And in sciences are exactly the same mm -hmm. where I was making a video about antimatter which if you think of, of a hydrogen atom is a proton and an electron mm -hmm. and they spin, you know, electrons like orbiting like a planet. Yeah. F swap it. So the proton would become a negative and the electron would become a positive. Mm -hmm. Everything else about it is the same. And okay. so, but describing that even now is tough. Right. Yeah. And so I went to this MIT engineer and I was like, does this video make sense? And she was like, I don't know what is happening in this video. Cause even though she is, you know, MIT engineering, yeah. like, right. and she does science communication and she was still like, I don't get this. Yeah. And, and she's like immersed in it every, in, in science video every day. And it's just not her thing. Right. Um, so it's just, there's so much room in all of these jobs yeah. because there, there's, there's specialization in everywhere. Right. I was just talking about that the other day, actually, with this podcast, even just the video aspect, the audio aspect, the hosting aspect, they're all different jobs. So it's yeah. like, you can't expect someone to know all of them at the, yeah, that makes yeah. a lot of sense. That's awesome. And then um, what, can you go into just a little bit about kind of what it was like um, maybe after your master's or I know you had the internship, but kind of moving into being an independent creator and kind of starting that, how did that go about for you? Was there challenges? Was there, you know, a, a part of it that you love so much it surprised you? Just anything there? Yeah, yeah. So after uh, AU, I had this info session and a, the job fair on campus and ended up at Discovery. Um, they had me with this Discovery News team. I was there for a long time. Uh, I worked with a different team for a while, but came back to Discovery News and we launched a YouTube channel, which is now called Seeker. It's owned by Vox. It's very big and um, it's more or less dormant at this point. Uh, they don't have a staff supporting it, but we made like 3,500 videos over the course of the run of that channel. Mm -hmm. uh, and then at some point it was sold to another company and sold to another company and then Vox bought it. Um, and in that time I was like, okay, I've, I've really, I know how this works. I should be able to do this myself. And then I'm not beholden to all of these different changes because it's this industry, this, th this digital media industry is very dynamic, mm -hmm. um, is a nice way to put it, but it's also, you know, it's very chaotic. Very polite way to put it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and so all of these things were changing and I was just like, I'm out of here. Yeah. I would like to have some stability. And it's sad when the stability is work for yourself and have no <laughs> understanding of if you're going to make money at all yeah. or what you're going to do. Um, and so I went independent and I took a month off because I was totally burned out okay. and I watched all the Marvel movies and television shows in order. Uh, and after that month was over, I was like, okay, let's sit down and figure this out. And so I made a video every week for about three months, just about whatever, just to kind of get back into the groove of making things. Okay. And the thing that surprised me was how much I liked editing videos. I didn't know I liked it, but there's a level of control there that you get, you get, that you can do whatever you want and you can really play with stuff in a way that I'd never done before, which was really cool. I mean, I had done it, but not in years. Um, and then as I became like this business, uh, I would start to pitch ideas to other companies and I would get contracts from them. And I would have people reach out and say, hey, we really like your work. Can you do this? And that, that was so validating and really exciting and some of those people I still work with. 
Um, and so I think the surprising thing was twofold. One, how long it takes. It took a while from when I left and became independent until I was sort of comfortable being independent, mm -hmm. maybe like a year or two, um, which seems like a long time. Uh, and it is. But looking back, it was like didn't feel that long. Right. And then the other thing was just like how much I enjoy being able to pitch ideas and have these like long term connections with people because right. then they want to make more stuff. You know, I work with PBS in South Florida yeah, to make a show California. called Stargazers. Um, they came to me and they said, hey, we need a new host. We have these astronomers who are hosting now. They're very good, but we want something a little younger and fresher and mm -hmm. different. We don't want to just like have a professional astronomer. We want somebody who's a science right. communicator. And I said, that sounds great. So I did a test. They liked it. And I've been doing it since then. That was like 2019, I think. That's um, and now I'm pitching other things to them. They're like, hey, do you have an idea for this you know, 360 dome we want to put up. And I'm like, yeah, I can come up with an idea for that. Mm -hmm. um, and there, and so now I'm pitching those ideas. And it, it, you just become, I don't know, things that I could not have done when yeah. I worked for a company because those were siloed, sort of the opposite of what we were just talking about, where those are siloed into different places within the company. When you work for yourself, you can do all of them. Right. Uh, and in some cases you have to, you know, like accounting, and like yeah. whatever. It, it, that's, I think the fun part is seeing what I can do, which I couldn't have done before. Right. Yeah. It's kind of like you, you, it lights a fire under, you know, under you. Cause you're like, okay, now it's up to me. I kind of got to make it yeah, happen. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. When and then just a little follow up there. So obviously you mentioned seeker and box and box, you know, purchasing, buying, purchasing, <laughs> buying seeker. Um, how did you go about because Vox is very notable. So how did you go about kind of self-branding? And, and you know, I put here kind of like um, your experience with bigger com companies finding your brand. So if there is there's any advice there, because I know a lot of people are, are freelancing, but, you know, to get to that point where now you're it's transactional and you're actually, you know, moving yeah. up in that sense, um, just any advice you could offer there? Yeah. You know, when discover working at Discovery in general was was great uh, uh, on a variety of different ways. It was also terrible in a variety of different ways, just like working anywhere, you know, to, to be totally frank. Part of it is it's a big company. You're one of many, many thousands of people working on, you know, parallel missions, mm -hmm. um, which is both interesting. It gives you a lot of room to specialize, um, but you're also subject to the whims of whatever that company decides to do the next day, you know, and, and, and that can be tough. Uh, when we were sold the first time, we were sold to a company called Group 9 Media. And Group 9 was a collection of digital brands, Thrillist, mm -hmm. The Dodo, SourceFed, which was spun out pretty quickly. Um, Seeker was one, and then I'm missing one. Anyway, doesn't matter. They don't exist anymore. <laughs> but the idea was that it was these brands from all over the digital sphere, and they did all of these different things. Um, and we were like the the premium sciencey brand, but they also right. had, you know, animals like the Dodo was animals and Thrillist mm -hmm. was like, I don't actually know bros and food, I guess. Right. Um, but it, you know, it was like, they had these different brands and that was neat, but it was a big change. And I remember the conversation in the office was it's really hard to get people on the phone yeah. and not literally on the phone, but just like get them to email us back. Cause yeah. when you're emailing from discovery and you got a discovery.com email address mm -hmm. and you're trying to talk to a scientist, they want to talk to you. Right. But when you're emailing from Group 9 Media, that yeah. doesn't really mean anything to them. Right. And so then when dis I left under the Group 9 time. And so now that channel that I built, though, is owned by Vox. And so now I changed my bio to say I built a channel that that is, it's Vox now. It, like there's no reason for me to put Discovery or Group 9 right. necessarily. I put Discovery because it's a big name and I put Vox because it's a big name. Right. Um, but I never worked for Vox. But the thing that I made is now owned by Vox. Yeah. And so I have I have I'm able to kind of you know borrow a little bit of that prestige mm -hmm. in order to say like, hey, they thought it was good. So if you want to work with me, maybe right. you should consider that too. Yeah. Um, and so it's sort of like you're getting 
you know, when on LinkedIn, when people are like, you should work with Brett, with, with Jennifer, she's great, you know, and it's just like, that's awesome. This is sort of like that, but you're doing it in a personal marketing way. Right. I'm terrible at personal marketing. Like I'm really bad at like building my brand. I just kind of do my thing and hope that people like it. And that's not what you're supposed to do. Um, and it worked fine when I had a big company behind me, but now that I'm independent, right. I have to find other ways to push myself out there. That's awesome. And I, I feel like there's so much value there too. But it's all it basically it's like an unspoken testimonial or like an unspoken reference when these yes. things happen, you know, because it's like, well, yeah. if they thought it was great, <laughs> yeah. I feel like you might. Yeah. Um, and so keeping awesome. an eye on that and being able to put it out there is like, hey, yeah. make notes for yourself and say, right. like, you know, there's a reason that websites have that thing where it's like press. Here's the things that people have posted about our company or people, you know. Yeah. Collect those things. Ask for testimonials. I do that anytime I work now. I didn't at first, but now okay. I'm like, hey, if you can give me a testimonial for my website or yeah. if they text me and they're like, oh, my God, that was so awesome. I'm like, cool. Can I put that on my website that you right. thought I was awesome? Do you want to add anything to that? Right. Um, those little things go a long way because word of mouth is the most powerful thing that you can have. And yeah. if they're not going to tell their friend about it, you can tell other people about it. You know? Right. And I actually want to transition to portfolios and kind of like your website, like you mentioned. So a th like there's must there must be thousands and thousands of videos at this point that you've worked on. Um, yeah. I know that a lot of students sometimes are looking for that, uh, those answers about the portfolios, which I'm sure you can find. However, when it comes to somebody who has so many different projects under their belt, how did you go about um, – choosing, I mean, the simple way is choosing which ones go on the website or the portfolio, but did you break it down more than that? Was it, you know, the things that reach the most people or the ones that did the best in numbers? Like, how did you choose kind of what you showcased for yourself, especially when you have so much work? Yeah. And, you know, people say great question to buy for time, but that was, that's a great question <laughs> <laughs> because it, it's all of those things. It's a little bit like, okay, if I'm when I sat down to build my portfolio, the first things I thought of were the videos that I really liked, mm -hmm. the videos that really spoke to me as a creative person, the videos that that I enjoyed making. Um, like there's a video that I have in my portfolio that's like me and my friend Amy eating ice cream and like lamenting about dating for like that was the cold open for the video. You know, it was it's 12 seconds or something. Yeah. And it's about why men have trouble getting over breakups based on these a couple of these studies that we had read. And obviously I remember that video and I liked it and I thought it was really funny. Yeah. So I picked it up. Is it like the best example? No, but it's a good general example. Mm -hmm. So some of the portfolio was just like, here's like generic videos that maybe they did well, maybe they didn't. It kind of didn't matter. It was just like, here's just baseline what I can do. Then you, of course, yes, want to pick the videos that do very well, the videos that are really prestigious. You get to go somewhere. You get to talk to someone. You know, I went to the White House Science Fair a couple times. I picked one of those videos. I went to the okay. Arctic Circle. I picked one of those videos. I flew in an F-18. Obviously, I'm going to pick that one. You know, so it's just stuff like that where you get to do these crazy things or you get a video that, you know, and not everybody gets to do that. So like if you're making TikToks, you might make them all in your living room or around your house or in your car. So pick the ones that do well, pick the ones that you feel good about, pick the ones that you're proud of your performance, you know, the ones that maybe you tried something new and you felt like it worked. Um, you know, you green screened yourself for the first time or the third time or whatever. And you're like, this time I nailed it. Yeah. Get that one because it's a it's like a resume. You're picking bullet points and nobody's going to watch all of them. I think that's. Right something to point out. People are going to look just like anything. They're going to look at the thumbnails. They're going to look at the titles and they're going to go, I'm going to watch this one. So right. if you're proud of everything in your portfolio, assume they're going to watch one and maybe a half, you know, because yeah. they're not going to watch it all. That makes sense. And I like that you said the things that you like, because I found that there are projects that while I'm very proud of, I don't have the same passion speaking on them as I do other ones. And I feel like that when you're able to speak on them with such like pride and passion that it makes such a difference in how people view yeah. it. I don't know if that's yeah, very Yeah, definitely. But, um, yeah. That's when awesome. I was the producer of our show, so after I, st I started as a host and a writer and eventually like worked my way up to being the producer of several of the shows when we were at Discovery and Seeker. Um, and what I used to say is your excitement, the audience can see that. Yeah. So if you're excited, they're excited. Right. 
And it's the same with anything else. You know, if you're just putting stuff on your resume or in your portfolio, that's like, I need to put this here because I need to. And it's like, you're not excited about it. And that's your whole resume. Yeah, that sucks. That sucks for you. It sucks for the people who are trying to hire you. You know, you want to put stuff in there that you're like, when they ask you about it, you're like, oh, I'm so excited to talk to you about this. This was so neat. What a cool project. That's great. And speaking of. Um, I just have to ask. So, how was it flying in the F eighteen? I mean, oh, I threw up all up in the F eighteen. What was that for? So we made a video. So it, it's funny how things actually work. You ready for? I'm gonna pull the curtain back. Yeah. It was our v- vice president's wife's college roommate worked for Boeing. Okay. And they had a new. Uh, they were testing out a new system. Um, within an old airframe. So it's an F, uh, F-18, f which isn't brand, like not a new right. plane. Um, but they were trying out, essentially when an F-18 flies into an area, they have, you're like, oh, well in the movies they have missiles and guns. And it's like, yeah, yeah that is something that they can have, but they can also have ways to block cell phones and Wi-Fi. And so that was what they were testing. And we're like, that's interesting. Never seen that before. And they still have never really seen people talk about it, but it's called an F-18EA, electronic attack aircraft. And so you'd have like a couple with missiles and guns and like cameras. And then you have a couple that, or like one that just blocks wireless signals to make sure that they're not like texting pictures to their other people about where the planes are or whatever. So it was really neat. And so we wanted to do the story um, and they were like, do you want to fly in it? And I was, and it's an F-18. So I was like, I don't like roller coasters. So yes, obviously I have to fly in it. <laughs> like no one has to do that. Uh, and they let me keep the flight suit. So that's cool. So I wear oh, it on Halloween awesome. now. <laughs> that's crazy. Just, uh, you know, all the Top Gun fans out there. But right now you are Trace Elements Media, correct? Yeah, correct. That's kind of where, and everything you do, comes from under that umbrella. Yes. Structure okay. wise. Yeah. So I'm an LLC, a okay. single member LLC. Um, I renew that every, you know, every year pay my LLC yeah. fees in California. We have to pay a, f- a fee to the franchise tax board every year. Um, and that LLC runs all the business more okay. runs is really just an entity that exists. Yeah. I remember I did my LLC in 2019, I believe, but I don't think mm-hmm. we've ever talked about LLCs on this podcast. Can you just give a little intro into kind of what that is if anyone has no idea what an LLC sure. means? Yeah. So when I first went independent, I was just, I'm just myself, right? Like you, you go on, you go on where, wherever you have a friend who wants you to do some work for them, whatever that is, and you right. do the work and they Venmo you or they, you know, pay you somehow, whatever that is. Um, and you're like, cool. That's f- totally a fine way to do business. It works totally well yeah. uh, for uh, freelancers. Um, and you just report that income to the IRS and your state and whatever. Mm-hmm. Long term, it's helpful to have an LLC and sometimes required. Yeah. So wh- why I did it is I was talking to a friend of mine who also does YouTube videos and other things. And she said, you should be an LLC eventually. Mm-hmm. Because what ends up happening is you get it's essentially a separate entity from yourself. And so you right. go and you just file paperwork. You can go legal zoom. You can go online and file paperwork. It takes no time at all mm-hmm. and, and apply for a tax number. And then what ends up happening is the business, which is a separate sort of a separate person can apply for things like insurance. I needed production insurance in case somebody fell on set when we were doing something. I needed insurance for that. And a person cannot get production insurance, but a company can. Right. And so I could apply through my LLC. And there are different levels of an LLC. So an LLC is literally just a piece of paper that says that this business exists. It has an address. It has a tax number. Mm -hmm. And this is the person who runs that business. Now, you can be a single member LLC, which is what I am. Yeah. So I'm taxed the same as a regular person. My business doesn't, I don't have to like file corporate taxes or anything. Right. Um, But that's my LLC. And then there are different levels above that. You can go all the way up to like a C corp, which is like a big multinational corporation. Right. And there are all these rules about paper and filings and you have to pay separate taxes and all sorts right. of things. And there are levels, so many levels in between that, like a handful. Awesome. Thank you for diving into that. I just realized that some people may not know what it means. Yeah. If you, if you get together with a bunch of independent people, yeah. eventually the talk comes around to like, so how did you structure, like I was at a wedding a couple weekends ago and my cousin owns a bike shop and I was just like, so how do you structure your business? Like what is that? 
And he's like, well, we're an LLC. And it's like, and I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. And so you end up talking about it because there's no rule book for how to do this. Right. Um, And once you've been independent for a while, once you make over a certain amount of year, it actually makes more sense to be an LLC. And at at some point it makes more sense to be a certain type of LLC Mm -hmm. um, because then you can pay yourself just like you would get a paycheck from a regular company. Right. And when that happens, it makes your taxes much easier. So it's so it sort of depends. Let's say you're doing a hundred jobs a year, even as a freelancer, you might be making so much money that it would make more sense for the business to be paying you rather right. than them just Venmoing you over and over right. again. You know? Yeah. No, that makes sense. And I feel like sometimes big companies will ask for your um employer identi- identification number, that EIN, mm-hmm. like, yeah. that, and, that, and then you're like, oh, wait, I need to make an LLC. So you might even, yeah, end up having to just make one for a yes. job you're doing. Definitely. Um, yeah, I, I got the insurance for a contract I did uh, during like high COVID. We had a pitch yeah. that I sent to PBS Digital Studios for a show called Animal IQ, still out there. Nice. Um, it's about animal intelligence. And I originally had pitched it as like, let's go to a zoo and talk to the zookeepers and like learn about these animals and how smart they are. Mm-hmm. But obviously it's pandemic. So instead we did it mostly digitally. You know, I Zoomed with the other guests and you know it was early on and we weren't really sure how to do it. So it didn't come out as good as I wanted, but it was very neat because it was cool to go through this whole process of hiring freelancers as an LLC because PBS Digital Studios doesn't work with people. They work with LLCs. Wow. So you have to be one yeah. in order to get the contract. Um, and so I would have had to make one anyone yeah. anyway. But luckily, I had made one like six months before. And so they're like, oh, are you a LLC? And I'm like, yeah, yep. a production yeah. company, Trace Elements Media. And they're That's like, great. Um, and it's been very helpful. That's awesome. For exactly stuff like that. Um, just a sidebar. Did COVID, how did that slow you down if at all especially as a video i mean as a content creator as a creator in general how did that um impact those few years i mean the it impacted me similarly to everyone else right obviously i was already working from home um so early on people were like how do you work from home and i'm like oh here i'll tell you how to work from home um you know uh put pants on that was my main advice was put pants on uh don't work from your bed (laughs) Um, which would now we all now we are all pretty aware that you don't do those things but at the time it was amazing to think of it was like people were like oh I'll just wear my pajamas and work in my bed all day and it's like you can't do that free gears it doesn't work Um, but in terms of video making I was already doing most of my work in my studio at home occasionally I would go out and I would you know do an interview with somebody in the field but that's expensive and when you work by yourself you have to pick and choose when that makes sense um, and so a lot of my stuff was remote anyway, or I was just like call, calling or emailing with people and getting them to answer my questions and then restating it. If anything, it became easier to reach out to people because okay. people understood video yeah. online yeah. Uh, where it's, again, very difficult to imagine. But in 2019, if I needed a scientist to get onto a video call, it was almost impossible. There was just it, they didn't know how to do it. They'd never done it before. They didn't uh, they didn't have the apps on their computer. They didn't know how to use those apps. They didn't have a good camera. They didn't have good audio. But now people are so much more aware of that, uh, which has been a real boost to my work because now I can just video chat a scientist. And in some cases, if it's at a big organization, you know, NASA was already already good at this, but they have like a media cart that they could roll into wherever the scientist is with a good camera and good audio and help that scientist do that interview. Um, and now they don't need to. Now they can just the scientist gets it. They can just go on Zoom and or wherever. And right. They know what to do. And just as a follow up to all of our LLC talk and you being an you know independent creator, how do you go about making money? I know sometimes that question <laughs> comes up and people wonder if it's, you know, I'm sure there are times when it's not as consistent as you may think. And um, really just can you give any insight into that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, digital creators make money in a variety of different ways um, in a different create the big creators it's a lot of brand deals uh, so you might sell a product to your audience um, whether you're selling it directly like oh you should buy this or if you're just presenting it like oh just got this brand new X you know new camera new whatever um, you know I'm using this new product if you look at the influencer market, especially in things like beauty, it's very clear when they're trying to tell you, hey, I'm trying this new product. Um, in sciences, it's a little more nebulous, no pun intended. You know, it's like you're doing things that are uh, 
kind of alignments. So I've sold ads on my YouTube channel where that will air alongside. I'll read a thing like on NPR when they're like, hey, and do this thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll have an offer code and they'll go sign up. Um, and hopefully they'll go sign up. Right. Uh, and for things like brilliant.org, which is a mathematical website where you can like learn math and physics and stuff, or Curiosity Stream or Nebula, which is a VOD service that I have now invested in because I think they're really cool. Um, you know, or whatever. And so you end up getting money from them and to put into your YouTube channel in front of your audience or into your okay. TikToks in front of your audience. Uh, that's one way. Um, the another, excuse me, another way to make money is books. You get a lot of people make, writing books. I haven't done that, but with really big audiences. And the reason they do that is because I have a big audience. Say I have a million subscribers. If 10% of those people buy a book, that's great. That's good sales. Yeah. Um, if 1% buy a book, that's still pretty good. Like, it's not great, but it's not bad. So there's a lot of different like ways to do that. Merch is another example. Books and merch are very similar where it's just mm -hmm. like you're selling things uh, to your audience. Um, and then another way to make money is you leverage, and this is how I make money, you leverage your digital products for more traditional products. So things like I make YouTube videos, but I don't make them necessarily so that I get to be YouTube famous. You know, right. I'm never going to be Mr. Beast. I don't want to be. I have no interest. Yeah. Um, I would like, however, a casting director or somebody who wants to do something for somewhere mm. that I agree with, some science program or something that, that aligns with my interests and my brand, they'll find my YouTube channel. They'll find my digital, my digital fingerprints, and they will hopefully then reach out. And I will be able to make money that way. Mm -hmm. uh, so the way I pay my bills is mostly through hosting this show for PBS television, okay. for pitching concepts that get picked up, um, and doing other things that are not even really about my digital media presence. It's just the digital media presence is sort of the billboard that points you to work me yeah. so yeah. that I can go get work elsewhere. Right. And so everybody makes money a little differently when it comes to digital creation. Uh, and that's, that's how I do it. When it comes to the LLC, having that means that then they pay the LLC. Mm -hmm. And so then the LLC, it's literally, it's literally a separate bank account and I just transfer money into my yeah. own bank account mm -hmm. um, because I don't pay myself with a W-2 or anything like that yet. However, having that LLC is really nice because then I can just say, you know, as silly as it is, it's, it just feels more professional to say, please you know, send a check to Trace Elements Media yeah. as opposed to sending one to me. Um, and then you can also get an agent who will help you. Um, agents come and uh, it's not what I think I thought it was originally. My agent doesn't like go and sell me places. I bring work to my agent and they're like a, they're a lawyer typically mm -hmm. who does the interaction with the brand for you. Uh, as my agent likes to say, he shakes the money tree to try and get more money out of the brand. That's awesome. Yeah. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but then you don't have to be the bad guy as the creator. You can yeah. show up, create, be creative, and somebody else was the bad guy and you were you knew the whole time right. that that was their job. That's So, awesome. that's helpful. Uh, but again, not the interaction that I thought it would be. Yeah. I feel like there's a lot of misconceptions around that too. Um, we had talked about that previously on another podcast as well um, with someone actually who was publishing a book. So it was just like a different type of, you mm -hmm. know, a book agent. Yeah. yeah. A book is just a different environment, but it's a whole different thing. Like I don't even have a book agent. So, and that's a, if you can have a commercial agent, you can have a book agent, you can have an acting agent, you can have a, yeah, you can have like a talks agent just for like conferences and talk, like you can have a lot of people working for you right. and it's becomes quite interesting and yeah. complicated. Right. Yeah. Yeah, they help though. <laughs> they do help. They they do. You yeah. know, I it, when I I if you told me ten years ago, you know, if, if you told me when I was at AU that like, okay, you're going to get a career, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. Eventually, you're going to have a lawyer and an accountant and an <laughs> agent and an editor and an assistant and a and it's just yeah. like I'm going to what? Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's just how it is. Must be a good feeling though. Sometimes it's yeah. like you just step back and you're like, this is this is neat. Yeah. This is a neat. Yeah. <laughs> and I like that you said like things like YouTube channels can be like the billboard or like the building blocks because I think we get so caught up in like I, I went into stand up comedy recently 
but I don't think I want to be a stand-up comedian. It was just like, what is, what is another building block that I can do that's going to help mm-hmm. me take that, you know, and produce a role or, you know, whatever it may be, right. putting on my own comedy shows, like things like that. Um, that just reminded me of that. I love that because admittedly, personally, I've been thinking about that, but it's nice to have it, you know, restated just because sometimes you think it's going to be like, oh, this is the end, but it's, it's not really, it could just be another building block to something you never thought you'd be doing. So awesome point. Keep yeah. That in there, mind. there, there is no end. Yeah. I think that was the, when I first got a, a job job, I was a personal assistant. Um, and I was helping people out when I was like 19 and the thing that bugged me was the, the inbox of stuff, not like email, but like do yeah. this, do this, do this, do this inbox never ended. Yeah. And the outbox never disappeared. It was just right. like, you're constantly doing, it's like you're on an assembly line. Yeah. I like to make packages of, you know, products, things like I like to make one YouTube video. I've shipped the YouTube video. I feel really good about it. And right. I make another one and I do that. Yeah. Um, and everybody works differently. Some people like one, some people like the other. Um, but yeah, thinking of all the different skills that are involved is so important. Yeah. So you're totally right to think of it as like building blocks. Yeah. If you can write, put that out there. Yeah. Make sure that people know. Because if you can write, but you don't have any examples of it, then no one knows that you can right. do it. Right. You know, and yeah. if you can edit yourself, you can video, you can do, yeah. you know. Yeah. It's it, all of those skills are important to right. the modern workplace yeah. in a lot of ways. Someone asked me the other day about personal scripts and if those count as writing. I was like, of course mm-hmm. they count as writing. Yeah. Not- one hundred percent counts as yeah, because you know definitely. whether it's some, you know something someone used or not, you wrote, and that's the skill they're looking for, and that's that. You know, it's yeah, pretty simple sometimes. Yeah, my I still talk to uh, so the grad department has a mentee mentor program. Mm-hmm. I'm in the mentor program, and one of my mentees now lives in LA, and we meet up occasionally. Awesome. Um, yeah, it was it's been really cool. Yeah, uh, and something I told her once was, and, and you know take it with the spirit it's given resumes are not legal documents they're marketing documents right and so make sure you put the stuff that's going to show you in the best light um and she was like i never thought about it that way Uh, and so we talked about that we talk about this idea a lot and it's the exact same with that my first resume before i'd had like a lot of professional work i literally put volunteer job on there and people were like but that's not a job and it's like i didn't get paid you're right but i ran that cotton candy stand right. at that at that festival yeah. for a week and i ran the whole thing and took the money and did all you know and that's an important thing to put yeah. on there and so just cuz you didn't get paid doesn't mean it's not a job you oh. know you you volunteered to help out your theater company with set design you did set design yeah. <laughs> like yeah. If you, you yeah, know. that's the thing. If you were on that set and you were touching those, it, it's, it's, counts. you're involved, it you know? Yeah. yeah. It's, and it just set yourself up for success. Don't, yes. don't be like, oh, well, that doesn't count, even though I did it. Yeah. You know, don't I knock yourself down. Sometimes people look at the word sugarcoat as like a negative, but I'm always like, sugarcoat that resume. Like, it, it, <laughs> you know, it's like, show the best version of yourself. It's like, that's you right. Said, you know, yeah. it's not, yeah. it you know, it's not lies, but you know, just right. Make exactly. it as best as you can make it. Yeah. Don't don't misrepresent. Yes. But best represent. But best for represent. Sure. Yeah, I agree. Would love to dive into the podcast now. So you're in the podcasting world. Can you tell yeah. us about your new podcast? It well, actually, by the time to- when we had talked, it had already uh, it was dropping that next week. Correct. Yeah, it was brand new. Uh, yeah. A few a few months ago. Uh, and now we're, I would say it's still new. It's a, we're at episode 11. We episode, uh, episode 12 is coming out next week. Okay. So we upload every other week. Um, and I've done podcasting before, but this is the first time I've like, I wholly own the podcast. We made up the format. We did the whole thing by ourselves and it's okay. been really, really fun. Uh, right. so the podcast is called that's absurd. Please elaborate. Um, and the show is essentially people send in questions and we answer them and we want the questions to be silly or strange or like weird. We don't want it to be like, why is the sky blue? We want it to be like, how do you build a Lego replica of the sun and how long would that take? And it's like, (laughs) that's awesome. we did the math and we figured it out and it was really, really fun to do that episode. (laughs) And there are episodes like that up and down the slate and we're getting new questions every day from the audience, which is so awesome. 
Uh, and it's myself and somebody I met while working for Discovery and Seeker named Julian. He's also a science communicator and we have really nice rapport. And so it just goes really well. And we bring on guests uh, when we have something like recently, the most recent episode um, as of this recording. So early September, late August mm -hmm. uh, was about, let's see, uh, Julian answered a question about what would happen if we were born with adult size hands and feet. Uh, I answered, can you smell something until it no longer exists? Like, can something disintegrate from being smelly? And then we had a guest from a company called Descript. She used to work for curiosity.com. Her name's Ashley Hamer. And she's a, got a master's degree in music. And one of the audience members had asked, why are not all music written in the same key? Like, why isn't everything just uh -huh. written in the same key? Because then you right. wouldn't have to worry about where on the piano you were playing. Everything would work the same. Because, And I play some music, but I'm not an expert. So yeah. it was so cool to have this like person with a master's degree in music come on and explain it to us. Yeah. Um, and so we try and do... It's a science podcast, but you don't yeah. have to be sciencey to listen to it because we don't we're not like, well, according to the paper of this <laughs> published and, you know, we're just, oh, well, let's think about it and yeah. try and make it accessible and fun and silly. And right. and it, it's great. And it's of really course, fun. there's I'm sure there's obviously planning that goes into every episode as every oh, yeah. does. But yeah. do you kind of leave that um, that space open for conversation, like to bounce off of each other? Or do you do like heavy you know, research beforehand? Like, how does that process go for such oh. absurd questions, rather? Yeah, I mean, that's the fun part, Grace, because we get to, like, do both of those things. We awesome. So Julian and I have been science communicators for a decade, at least, each. Um, and so, like, we'll do a few hours of research. We'll write up bullet points about okay. our question. Mm -hmm. And we don't share the question answer. Like, we don't share any of our research with each other until the mics are on. Right. Um, so that way we don't because we've done we've done this in the past where like oh my gosh and we'll end up talking about it on the phone and we're like we weren't recording any of that and we probably should right. have been um so we keep it fresh for the podcast itself yeah. to get the best reactions but then also we wrote into i love a template okay. yo i templatize everything yeah so i don't have to look at a blank sheet of paper ever i open up a, a template and it's like fill in these boxes here answer these questions fill out this stuff yeah. and then you're you're on your way to writing a script right and one of the things i have in my template is leave room for guests leave room for the other people you know ask them questions talk to them about what you've learned so when it came to like the things that were smelly yeah uh, i you know we always ask how this question comes up and so either the audience or one of the other hosts come up with the questions and we ask them how so they can tell a personal story. Mm -hmm. We make sure that there's like a back and forth. So when we do questions where they're, where it's relevant, like about pets or something, I'll ask, you know, okay, so you're a cat person, right? And then Julian will have a conversation. And all of that is scripted. The idea is okay. it. we know that it's going to happen. Right. Um, even if Julian doesn't, I do, because I've written the answer in such a way where I've left space right. like like you say has there been an episode that's really stood out to you so i mean fun. the every time people talk about the podcast i'm like what was the latest episode because <laughs> when you've made as many I things as i've made i already for, have trouble remembering them all um the lego sun one really yeah. stands out and yeah. the reason is uh, this gal I used to know years and years ago messaged me on Instagram and was like, Hey, I was listening to your podcast with my kid yeah. and he loves it and wanted to know a question. And she oh. like DM would me like, how long would it take to build a Lego replica of the sun? And I said, that's a great question. I'm going to do it on the podcast. Yeah. And I, and his, her son was five. And I said, can you get audio that's from amazing. him so that we can put it in the podcast and he can ask the question. And she was like, yeah. And she, she sent it to me and we did the episode and it was so fun. It's uh, episode nine. Episode nine. Okay. Um, universally bricked. Uh, and it's about that. Um, and then it, it was just so it stuck out to me because it was so ridiculous. Yeah. As a question. Yeah. Uh, the sun is just so big that it's un impossible to fathom. Um, and then it was just a, a fun thing to get to interact with the audience in that way. Yeah. Making YouTube videos and doing television, you get to interact with the audience, but not as directly, yes. right? You see YouTube comments, which are 
a garbage fire and you yeah. you get like people coming up to you on the street and being like, oh, I love your show. And it's like, right. it's the best feeling. Yeah. But having someone submit a question and send you an audio clip that yeah. you then just get to answer right there. And even though they're not in the room, it's just, it feels awesome. Yeah. It feels really awesome. I feel like it's like that um, back in the day, well, back in the day, but you know, that like just radio show feel of like, call, yeah, you know, yeah. Caller, what's your question? Like, I just yeah, love that like, yeah. interaction, you know, because I feel like we've kind of lost a little bit of that art. Um, right. And also when your your audience is five-year-olds, like when you had stated that question <laughs> earlier, I was like, that's a pretty interesting question. But to think that a five, I mean, that's awesome. That's so cool. Yeah, cool. it was really great. He did a great job that's asking amazing. the question on audio too. Yeah. Um, it's so funny, <laughs> like this is an AU podcast. And it's funny, I didn't think about it until this minute. But my capstone was about something very similar to this, that that idea of like interaction, because so a little bit about that. The YouTube yeah, so my my capstone was, yeah, about YouTube comments mm -hmm. and the state of the union. So under o the Obama era, yeah, they did a YouTube kind of town hall when YouTube had a politics section, okay. um, like a, a team. Mm -hmm. um, and they submitted questions from users and played them for the president. Uh, in a in the White House somewhere, you know, okay. and then filmed it all after the State of the Union. It's like this State of the Union airs, the rebuttal airs, and then this aired. Uh, and the idea was to kind of have this dialogue. And so my capstone was more qualitative, and I wanted to know, do those people feel like they talked to the president? Like, their question was played for him. He wasn't, they weren't there, but they asked it, and it was answered, or at least they played it and maybe he made a right. you know spin around it or didn't really yeah. answer it, but like was, was essentially talking about the question they had. Uh, and that's kind of like what I'm doing now in that now I'm taking these questions from people mm -hmm. and whether they feel like they're talking to me or not based on my capstone, they likely do. And yeah. based on talking to this person, this kid's mom, uh, he felt like he was in the podcast and that we had a nice conversation. Yeah. And it was really funny. Um, but that was basically what my capstone was about, was yeah. do people who just submit questions into the ether mm -hmm. feel like they're in a dialogue? Like, yeah. And they said, I, I went and found them, which took a while. Um, it was like a master's program in, inter in internet stalking. Um, but I found these people and I was able to email them and be like, hi, I'm a researcher. <laughs> I'm researching this for my project. Uh, and of the 12 questions, I think I found nine of the people that's not bad um yeah and like seven of them that's, responded that's so awesome. i felt pretty good about yeah. it um more than it would have been nice if there were more people so i could have a little more yeah. quantitative right. information yeah. or if they did it a bunch of times but it only was yeah. i think done twice or once or twice over a couple of years so was the general consensus that it was yes that they did feel like they were interacting yeah generally them? speaking yeah. all of them were more or less positive on the interaction they felt like they were heard they felt like they were seen yeah they felt like the president either didn't necessarily respond to their question but at least heard their question and then formed a, an answer of some type you know either That's they're a politician so not every yeah. pe presidents aren't always beholden to answer the question to the letter you know they're going to say what they need to say but awesome. uh, it was really interesting to hear their responses yeah uh and that's i mean we really sort good. of know this from yeah. radio shows and things they're like right. they feel like people feel like they're in yeah. this conversation and it's really powerful but that's kind of cool how you've come full circle there <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize it yeah. until right now. <laughs> That's so cool. Awesome. And then on that, um, AU kind of podcasting, science communication, everything that you've done thus far. Um, and then looking back on, you know, graduating from AU, we always love to ask this question. Do you have any advice for our students who are either graduating undergrad or their master's or just going into this crazy world of communications that is um, today? But any advice there? We always like to just kind of end on. Mm. Um, I think that the best advice that that I can give is just to have. Well, I mean, like the cliche advice is like, have an open mind and, yeah. you know, be a good like the thing I like to tell students is all work is group work. All of it. There is no really individual good. project, yeah. none um, in the business, even as an individual person who works by myself, uh, I have to hire people who know more than me about stuff. No one knows everything about everything. Uh, and so because of that, 
that's what I tell students when I go to like classrooms and stuff is all work is group work. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is because all work is group work to just be, be nice. You know, I have this thing. <laughs> Can we swear on your podcast? Cause sure. my mom, okay. My mom, uh, I have the sticky note on my desktop that says, uh, be friendly and enthusiastic, be humble. Don't be an asshole. No one wants to work with an asshole. And I was like, thanks mom. <laughs> and so I keep it on my desktop, not because point. I have like asshole tendencies, but because everybody has a bad day, yeah. you know? So you want to make sure you don't take that out on your coworkers because yeah. you have to hang out with them. And communication right. is a small community, even though there are lots and lots of people you know, you go to a conference and you're like, oh, wow, you've been in the industry a while. And now everywhere you go, you yeah. see someone you know or you used to work with. So if you burn those bridges, yeah, it, it's there's only so many places to work. And they're going to be like, oh, I worked with that person. They were awesome. Right. You know? Yeah. The world travels. Uh, word travels the fastest in this industry. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> that is what we do. <laughs> yeah. You're right. It's like well, we're all out there to do. But then we're also like, oh, God, that was quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right trace i think that brings us to the end thank cool. you so much for coming on media in the mix i feel like there's a lot yeah. we talked about today that we've never talked about on the podcast so thank you for that well, I i'm glad i could help students take some notes on this episode because there's a lot of gems in here and uh i'll leave you to close out if there's anything you want to say Sure. Yeah. You can find uh, any of my YouTube videos, all my social media. It's just my name, Trace Dominguez, for the most part. Um, I mentioned TikToks, but I'm actually uh, don't do TikToks. I just watch them and help other people make video. Yeah. Uh, not that I don't want to. If you have advice, I'd love some advice on how to make TikToks. I need oh, to get sure. better at it. Um, if you want to listen to my podcast, it's everywhere podcasts are. That's absurd. Please elaborate. Again, you can probably just search for Trace Dominguez. Um, and then I've also sent a uh, little clip here to media in the mix of our um, unbricking the universe uh, episode where we talk about the sun and answer Matthew's question from when he was five. So pretty cool. All right. And you're about to hear a little sneak peek of that episode. So enjoy. We've got a lot to talk about. I know we should dive into this. We really should. Do you want to go first or shall I? <sighs> Who went first last week? I it think you me. did. So I'll me. go first this week okay. with the very easy to uh, describe question that we got from a five-year-old listener from Canada. Wow. I know. I actually, his mom was listening and she DM'd me on Instagram and said, my five-year-old has a question. My name is Matthew and I live in Canada. How long would it take to make a Lego, Lego replica of the sun? Wow. And I was like, I have to answer this, this question. This is a good one, yeah. So this one is really, really exciting. There's some math in this warning, math oh, warning. Oh, no. Um, but it's going to be really good. So what are your initial thoughts I want to know before I oh, dive boy. into my answer? Uh, you and I are both lovers of, of brick-based uh, you know, educational toys. Yeah. Let's be real. You know, yeah. like we can call them models or, or sculptures. All they're, they're toys. Yeah. But I can't help myself. I absolutely still throw my money at that Danish corporation every time like they release something new. They just came out with a Pac-Man. I know. Ugh. And you can play it. Ugh. 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 Anyway, anyway. Take all my money. So having a lot of familiarity with that, I think this is going to be pretty eye-opening on just how freaking enormous the sun is yes it's it's so so large and i'm imagining like building it out of the classic like two by four yeah lego element um and i think it's going to be a, an in utter, utterly absurd amount of time yes i'm i'm just gonna tell you you're totally right okay, it is good. an absurd amount of time I didn't choose the two by four, oh. although we, just to make it a little more fun. So I sort of just had to pick something and run with it. The okay. two by four was my first thought. The thing about this question is it really comes down to a few different things. Uh, the first thing is we need to know the thing that we're replicating, the sun. We need to know the bricks that we're using. So uh, you mentioned two by fours. I didn't pick that and I'll tell you why in a second. And we need to do the math. And the reason I didn't use the two by four brick is because the bricks are kind of complicated. They're not squares. So let's go with the bricks first because we're already talking about it. Quick sidebar, 
I failed calculus. Okay. I'm not super always confident in my math skills. I love math, but I don't always know if I'm good at it. I want to put a big old asterisk on all my math, and I always try and double check it as best I can, but I hope I didn't miss math this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you so hope you didn't miss math. I didn't want to miss math this. Uh, so, a two by two square brick is only a square from the top down. Mm. From the side, it's actually slightly shorter. So, its dimensions are. 15.2 millimeters by 15.2 millimeters by 12.7 millimeters. Okay. So it's just slightly shorter. We're not a perfect cube here. Right. And so the reason I bring up the globe set is because how it got around this problem that it's not actually a symmetrical brick is you build a skin of mm-hmm. flat plates. And those flat plates taper as they get near the top and they get wider as they get near the middle. Okay. Now, that works if you're building a set with an internal structure. There is a Lego model, which you can see the box right here in the room because I just built it not that long ago, yep. of the, the, the Earth. The it's globe. a globe model. Yeah. And so I took inspiration from that oh. because what happens is in the globe model, if you're not a Lego person, all Lego system blocks or Lego bricks can work together because they're all uniform in size. The studs are the same. The depths are the same. So what we're assuming here is rather than building the entire sun out of an internal structure and all of these pieces, because you'd have to use thousands and thousands of different piece types in order to make everything work together, I tried to keep the math as simple as possible and give us an extremely rough estimate of just how to build the skin part. So just a plate flat, one plate thick, a 10 stud by 10 stud square. Okay. And so I calculated it based on that because it's a symmetrical piece that we don't have to care that it's not uh, symmetrical in height. Uh, and it, it makes the math a lot easier. And this is a complicated problem that even people who are Lego creators work with, um, which is that, and luckily for me, people who are smarter than me have come up with something called the LDU. Do you know what an LDU is? Because I didn't know what it was. 